Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the 2016 Healthy Retail Webinar Series. This is Emily Snyder at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Please set the audio tab on your GoToWebinar control panel to the method you are using, speakers to listen through your computer, or telephone to listen on the phone. Your line is muted. Please ask questions using the chat box on the GoToWebinar control panel. We're looking forward to a lively Q&A session following presentation from today's expert speakers. The topic for today's webinar is grocery store nudges and food formulations. Grocery store nudges can support positive or negative health outcomes. By placing certain foods in more prominent places, thereby increasing visibility, availability, and accessibility, accessibility retailers nudge their customers to select some foods over others. Food companies also design products so that, so that they will market themselves in supermarkets. Foods formulated to induce consumption often have high levels of salt, sugar, and fat. Moreover, the food formulations available to people influence the levels of sodium, added sugar, and trans fat in their diets. We're so pleased to be co-hosting today's webinar with the Food Trust. I would now like to turn it over to Stephanie Weiss, Associate Director at the Food Trust. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, the Food Trust is really thrilled to co-host this webinar with CSPI today. Um, our mission at the Food Trust is to ensure that everyone has access to affordable, nutritious food and information to make healthy decisions. Um, we believe that both access and availability of healthier products as well as grocery store nudges are key drivers to building demand and they are key ways to educate consumers to, to select, purchase, and consume healthier food. As we work across communities in this country and re as we work across communities and retail settings, including corner stores and grocery stores, we're really seeking to incorporate many of these marketing strategies in our work. Um, my contact info is at the bottom of the screen if anybody has questions about um, some of the food trust work in this area. Next slide. The marketing tactics and strategies employed by retailers and manufacturers can really help tip the best balance of family purchases in a healthier direction towards more nutritious foods. And there are many of these factors that consumer factors that influence what consumers buy, often referred to as the four P's of marketing, price, promotion, placement, and products. Knowing that much of grocery store purchases are unplanned, um, we're really looking forward to today's presentations um, from our expert speakers to learn more about their work and how, they, how we can incorporate these strategies to nudge shoppers towards healthier products. Um, so Emily, I'm going to turn it back to you to, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Michael F. Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson is co-founder and president of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. CSPI is a key player in battles against obesity, cardiovascular disease, and other health problems using tactics ranging from education to legislation to litigation. Dr. Jacobson has written numerous books and reports, including Nutrition Scorecard, Six Arguments for a Greener Diet, Salt the Forgotten Killer, and Liquid Candy, How Soft Drinks Are Harming Americans' Health. And perhaps most relevant to today's webinar, CSPI has led the 20-year-long campaign to get artificial trans fats out of the su food supply, which has resulted in companies reformulating food products to phase out artificial trans fats. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, and I'm really glad to participate in this webinar. Um, the, when people talk about nudges, I think they usually think about um, putting the salads at the beginning of the cafeteria line instead of the end of the cafeteria line, or putting um, low-fat milk at eye level and um, whole milk down around knee level. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a somewhat different kind of nudging, which is really pushing and shoving, you know, kind of a much more powerful thing. And it has to do with trans fat. Now, for a long time, there was, next slide. Uh, for a long time, there was almost no evidence that trans fat posed any risk. In the 1970s, the FDA commissioned a review of the safety and they found uh, no reason to be concerned. And then 10 years later, in the mid-1980s, 
the FDA did another review. And, you know, there were shreds of evidence of a problem, but no, no real solid evidence. That all changed around 1990, when a good study was done showing that trans fat, which is found in, uh, or was found in things like Crisco, um, hard shortenings, and mar stick margarines, uh, found that, that the tr we found that researchers around 1990 found that trans fat raised the bad cholesterol and lowered the good cholesterol, meaning that it was a significant contributor to heart disease. Um, and that study was re that kind of a study was repeated in the in the early 1990s, and by 1993 it was quite clear that trans fat was a problem, but it wasn't clear how much of a problem it was. The uh, so in 1994. CSPI petitioned the Food and Drug Administration to require labeling of trans fat. Um, and that, that evidence built up over the uh, 1990s and the 2000s. Harvard researchers estimated that trans fat was causing about 50,000 deaths per year. You know, clearly one of the biggest problems in the food supply and a radical change from the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, next slide. The, the, um, the first, um, you know, when the evidence started coming in, we monitored that evidence, and then in 1993 and more formally in 1994, called for labeling, called on the FDA to, re, to include trans fat on the nutrition label, which was just being introduced. It went into force in 1993. Um, still a lot of discussion in the scientific community. And uh, we doubted that the FDA would act quickly, um, but we waited to see what would happen. Meanwhile, the evidence built up. There was clinical evidence, then epidemiology evidence. Next slide, please. And um, we had done the formal thing with the Food and Drug Administration. The next thing was to um, nudge the public by generating publicity about the scientific research showing the harms from artificial trans fat. And that really built up over, over the next decade. Um, in um, the next slide, please. And I want to go, so times uh, moved on. The, the um, um, Food and Drug Administration, after about a 10-year delay, uh, said that trans fat had to be listed on packaged food labels. And they gave the industry three years to change the labels on their on their foods, and that that was a big nudge. And until then, very few food companies replaced trans fat or the partially hydrogenated oil, which was the source of the trans fat. Very few companies replaced it with healthier oils. And frankly, everything was healthier. Um, even the most um, questionable oils, like palm oil and coconut oil, uh, are not as bad as partially hydrogenated oil. So, so that was in 2003, and that that was a powerful nudge. Many food companies listed, and they all had to list trans fat, but that was an, in, an incentive to get rid of it. So we saw a lot of change in the packaged food world. Uh, but by then, the evidence had built up so much that Denmark had banned trans fat from foods around uh, 2003. And we thought that if it could be done in Denmark, it certainly could be done in the United States. So in, in 2004, we called on the Food and Drug Administration to ban trans fat. Um, and again, the FDA sat on uh, this proposal. Uh, it was just instituting the, the labeling requirement, and so they weren't about to, to uh, ban trans fat. But remember, trans fat labeling only affects foods with labels, and restaurant foods don't have labels. So, uh, so uh, we and others decided to go right to the manufacturers 
with, uh, in restaurants with lawsuits. A lawyer named Stephen Joseph on the West Coast was the first to file lawsuits. Uh, he sued McDonald's not because their foods had trans fat, but because McDonald's didn't remove trans fat after it said it would. So they basically deceived the public. And he got a big settlement, uh, I think about $8 million, that was given to the American Heart Association, which persuaded them to get involved in the trans fat effort. And Stephen Joseph, the West Coast lawyer, uh, in the same year sued Kraft Foods for not listing trans fat on the label. Remember, it wasn't required yet by the Food and Drug Administration, but uh, Stephen Joseph thought they still had a legal obligation to disclose that uh, on, on their products. And those two lawsuits really shook up the restaurant and food manufacturing world and persuaded them to do research on replacing trans fat to replacing partially hydrogenated oil. And after that, CSPI sued Kentucky Fried Chicken and sued Burger King uh, a couple of years later. And that persuaded those companies to move ahead. Meanwhile, McDonald's had found a way to make their, their uh, french fries and other foods without partially hydrogenated oil. Um, so here we're, we're waiting for the Food and Drug Administration to ban trans fat. There's steady progress in packaged foods uh, and some decent progress in the restaurant world where um, most of the big restaurants were removing it. We thought, though, there ought to be another nudge. And Emily? Um, and we discovered that Long John Silver's had a meal with 33 grams of trans fat. According to the Heart Association's recommendation, that's more than 16 days worth of trans fat in this one meal, where there's fried fish, fried potatoes, fried everything. I wouldn't be surprised if the coleslaw was fried. The, um, we call it the worst restaurant meal in America. And boy, did that um, go viral on the web. And I think it was about a week later that the, the president and the CEO of Long John Silver's visited CSPI and said that they were going to remove trans fat within the next three months. And I give them credit, they did. And their, their foods are much more healthful than they had in the past. They told us their sales simply tanked because of all the publicity. Um, at the same time all this was going on, cities, starting with New York City and, and California later, banned trans fat from restaurants. And so all, that affected every national chain and so many regional chains and all the independent restaurants in California, Seattle, New York, um, Brookline, Massachusetts. Philadelphia, and, uh, and and so that was another nudge. There's nothing like a ban uh, to change the content of the food supply. Um, so let, let's um, go to, um, to um, the, uh, two slides later, next slide. And the um, finally, in 2015, last year, the Food and Drug Administration banned trans fat, banned partially hydrogenated oil, saying it simply wasn't safe. They've given the food industry three years to reformulate their products. Uh, in this, during this three-year period, the food industry is pushing for exemptions, where um, they're saying little bits of trans fat are not harmful. The FDA is saying basically everything is harmful every bit of trans fat. But I think in the end, there'll be some products that will get exemptions. And hopefully, there'll be, um, there'll be very minor products. On the previous slide, um, so the, the, um, there's been tremendous progress with 90% of the trans fat has been removed from the food supply. Seven billion pounds less I'm sorry, uh, 7 billion pounds less partially hydrogenated oil. It's an incredible change. And, and I really give credit to the entire food chain where, uh, where we see consumers reading about this, pressing manufacturers 
to provide foods without trans fat. Manufacturers going back to the oil processors saying, give us better oils that don't have trans fat. The oil processors went to the seed companies and said, can you develop different breeds of soybeans and, and uh, sources of canola, corn oil maybe, that won't that could be used instead of the uh, partially hydrogenated oils that we've been using. And the seed companies went to the farmers and said, hey, we'll pay you a bonus if you grow these seeds instead of the customary seeds. So the farmers said, hey, that's a great idea. And they began growing uh, these new plants. And gradually, the, the supplies ramped up. Manufacturers started using them, bragging on labels, zero grams or no trans fat and people got healthier foods. And I think that 90% is going to gradually inch up to maybe 98%. Um, and, and in the end, this will be a tremendous public health victory, saving tens of thousands of lives a year. And I presume that many of these lives are already being saved. And so it's a different kind of a nudge. It's a nudge that involves massive national publicity, uh, petitions to the Food and Drug Administration, regulations by the Food and Drug Administration, um, bans by uh, state and local governments. Um, and you know, our feeling is that use the most power, powerful nudges that you can. And sometimes it may be a ban. Um, and so we, we're seeing certain uh, restrictions or requirements in school food programs and government procurement programs uh, and elsewhere. And so next two slides. And so uh, let's assume that we've pretty much taken care of the trans fat problem. What about some of the remaining problems in the food supply? We're consuming roughly twice as much sodium and mostly from salt as we should. And that's contributing to as many as 100,000 premature deaths every year. And we're consuming too much sugar, sugar and high fructose corn syrup, with the biggest source being soda. And there's one estimate that the, con the soda consumption in the United States is causing 24,000 premature deaths every year. And, uh, and not just uh, regular soda, but also energy drinks fruit drinks, sports drinks, uh, and, uh, and, and the like. So there's these two huge problems. How can we use, what can we do to, to solve these problems? And um, there'll be some, uh, you know, here, in both cases, we've petitioned the FDA to set limits on both of these ingredients. Um, the FDA said that it will be announcing targets for sodium levels in packaged foods. Um, and hopefully we'll begin to, we'll see those targets in the next two months. Um, another nudge, we sued the FDA for working, for going too slowly on this. We petitioned the agency 10 years ago, and it still hasn't acted. Um, sugar is probably a tougher one. But the kinds of things people are talking about, in addition to limits, on the sugar content of foods are voluntary targets, maybe a different target for cookies, another one for cakes, another one for uh, frozen desserts, another one for soda. Um, warning labels on soda. Uh, soda, sugar, sugar drinks in general, are far and away the, the biggest problem with sugars. And uh, so there are things like uh, warning labels on containers, um, bans, uh, on public property um, uh, and and other approaches that uh, are and, and then massive publicity and there certainly has been massive publicity in the sugar end and soda consumption has declined by 27 percent per capita since 1998 uh, sodium consumption hasn't changed all that much so we need a lot of work on both of these ingredients. Uh, so you know that's a, a different kind of nudging that that most behavioral economists think of.
but considering the magnitude of the problem, we need not just nudges, but some pushing and shoving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. I'll now turn it over to Stephanie, who will introduce our second speaker. Great. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker. I'm a big fan of his work, um, Dr. Colin Payne. Um, uh, Dr. Payne is an Associate Professor of Marketing and Co-Director of the New Mexico State University Consumer Behavior Lab. He currently studies how to improve fruit and vegetable purchases in the grocery store without increasing shopper budgets. And this research effort is funded by the um, United States Department of Agricultural ERS, Economic Research Services. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Colin and hear about his work. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with all of you today and uh, kind of uh, can I give you a, a tour of, of kind of the, the research we've been doing over the past uh, five or six years and appreciate the, the viewpoint of the, the previous speaker and, and his knowledge there and I, I learned a lot, so uh, thank you. So the, these uh, have to um, you know, recognize some of my great colleagues here at New Mexico State University, Mihai Nicolescu and then Carlo Mora and then colleagues at USDA, Lisa Mancino and Joan Guthrie, who have who very much so kind of informed this research that we've been doing. Uh, so we are, we're the Consumer Behavior Lab at New Mexico State University in very warm Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, our lab has uh, some eye tracking software and hardware uh, to track eye movements, for example, with sales circulars to understand how to better construct them. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that later. We also have a virtual grocery store that we can uh, uh, collect data of, uh, of, of how uh, grocery environments can be changed to improve healthier purchases and so forth. And uh, we're working with a retail chain called PainSave out of uh, Littlefield, Texas, which has uh, 150 stores in uh, the southwest region here. And uh, in fact, we're, we're leaving a little bit later to today to see if we can install some more of these uh, behavioral economic or what we call a shopper marketing nutrition interventions in about 50 of their stores and uh, what's really great about this collaboration is that we have direct access to their enterprise resource management system so we can, we can actually directly pull data to get uh, updates on how these interventions are working or not. Uh, one thing we're really um, excited about is uh, we're building a data tool to allow us to actually extract not only this uh, purchase data but what nutritionally speaking is in the items that uh, are being purchased. So the first picture here, it's, it's, a, it's actually a, a picture in the uh, northwest U.S. of a uh, Kroger store. Uh, there are so many choices in the grocery store, literally you know, 70 different types of toothpaste, you know, 50 different types of teas, and it becomes very difficult to know what to, to choose. Um, in addition, I mean, sometimes there are confusing messages. You walk through the grocery aisle and you see Cocoa Krispies, and, and I have three kids, and uh, you know they want this stuff, and and uh, they're tugging on my on my shirt to get it, and then parents see uh, front of package labeling like now helps your child's immunity, and uh, they feel somewhat supported in their child's wanting of, of Cocoa Krispies, although this front of package doesn't actually exist anymore um, because the FDA and FTC uh, said you better you guys better regulate yourselves, or we'll do it for you. Um, also, different uh, pricing schemes inside of the grocery store makes it very difficult for for people to actually understand whether or not they're getting a good deal. And that picture right there is just simply a bonus funny picture. Um, so I have three children. Um, so when we go to the grocery store, I, I can tell you that uh, these pictures accurately rep represent at one time the uh, the grocery store experience from the, the kid inside of the uh, frozen food freezer there, and then uh, kids actually eating the food while they're, they're in the grocery store. It, uh, it's very difficult for parents to actually um, think about and understand what they're putting inside their cart for their family's welfare, uh, nutritional welfare. And even despite their best intentions, they sometimes end up with, with food that is less healthy than they suppose. So what I want to talk about uh, today a little bit is understanding how we can um, increase healthier purchases without without actually expanding consumer budgets. And I'm just going to do 
uh, three or four of these quick shots, you can kind of understand some of the stuff that uh, we're up to. So uh, <clears throat> our retailer partner, PainSave, has a pat their their distributor, which uh, distributes fresh fruits and vegetables to a thousand different retailers. They have a packaging program uh, where they they package together pairs of fruits and vegetables, um, and then uh, strategically prices them at a price point that is, is uh, uh, appealing for lower income consumers. And um, so Pay and Save decided uh, to actually engage in this packaging program and then we uh, simply placed the uh, a, a refrigerator close to the, uh, the, ch the checkout aisle and then also uh, told the, the cashier to uh, suggest to sell these low-cost uh, fruit and vegetables. And the nice thing about fruit and vegetables in grocery stores is that they're one of the highest uh, profit margin categories for grocery stores. And the reason partly is because um, it, they're a highly perishable item, so they have to kind of jack up the price to make up for that. So if they can actually um, go through f fresh fruits and vegetables more, then their the profit margins actually uh, increase more so than um, other other product areas. Um, and what we're working with now is continuing to do this suggestive selling with uh, the cashier, especially with with WIC, because um, as as you know, as many of you know, uh, the WIC fruit and vegetable voucher has a has about twenty percent of it goes un, un, unused, and so one way to actually get at that is after they actually receive their receipt, is to actually uh, do some suggestive selling for um, fresh fruit and vegetables, such as we did in this, this this study, to see if we can get them to get those fruit and vegetables into their, their carts for those who are most nutritionally vulnerable. And it's interesting with uh, suggestive selling with cashiers because uh, many people report that, that it's the only time that they actually interact with anyone from the store, and there are a lot of studies that suggest that uh, more interaction with, with uh, the grocery store personnel increases customer satisfaction. And they're doing, grocery stores are doing suggestive selling already for social causes such as March of Dimes, et cetera. And I, th I think a, a case can easily be made that uh, uh, increasing fresh fruits and vegetables is also a, a social cause um, likewise. And so just some, some, uh, some brief results on, on what we found. So we took a look at um, SNAP purchases of what are called micro packs, those uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that I mentioned. We had uh, three stores in uh, Gallup, New Mexico area, very diverse population in the, in the uh, northwest part of, of the state, uh, all within the same zip code. So we could compare what, what occurred when we actually did this intervention versus a control store, which didn't. And it, it seemed to work, simply placing the fresh fruits and vegetables up front and suggestive selling the, the fruits and vegetables increased these uh, the produce sales by 109% and 94% respectively. Another uh, example of, um, of uh, grocery store nudges, uh, we knew that the grocery cart was a, uh, a, some, a, a salient uh, object for customers as they go through the store that it is always with them and very little research has been done with regards to understanding how to actually provide accurate um, social information to consumers to know how much fruit and vegetables to purchase. I mean it's a very ambiguous kind of activity. You might have it in your head how much to get um, but you don't really know what everyone else is doing and so we provided what are called social norms to these individuals inside of the, these grocery carts by simply placing a placard in the, the front, inside, and outside that said, basically, in this store, most people choose at least five produce items. So we actually found in the individual stores about how many items of fresh fruit and vegetables people purchased. And then the most popular, so you can tell this is pretty region specific, we have uh, bananas, limes, avocados, corn, oranges, tomatoes, et cetera. And what the, uh, the smiley icon is, is, is it uh, reinforces people, we found in the literature, who are already purchasing above the norm um, so that they don't actually decrease their purchases uh, towards the, the lower number, but then simply moves those people who are already under-purchasing up to the norm. And I'll show you the results here in a second, but another kind of quick shot uh, intervention. So the race, what's called the racetrack of the grocery store is the most heavily trafficked uh, area um, and people 
jaunt in and out of the aisles. Very rarely do they go through the entire aisle. And so we knew that the race, what's called the racetrack of the grocery store is super salient in terms of people shopping. And uh, so we included what were called injunctive norms, basically suggesting why people should go in the, the suggested direction. Uh, specifically on these green arrows that you see, we, we said uh, follow the green arrow for a healthy heart, a healthy weight, and simply for, for health. And what's nice about the grocery floor, you're starting to see kind of alternative ar advertising in the store already with uh, floor mats and floor stickers. But for the most of re retailers, this, both the, the grocery carts and the grocery floors are not yet bought by manufacturers. And so we had to find ways around uh, what are called slotting fees that manufacturers have to pay to retailers to strategically place their items on the end caps of of aisles, for example, and at the checkout checkout aisles. And here, here were here's some of the results that we we found with uh, some of some of our preliminary testing. So, for the uh, the arrow, for example, uh, we were able to increase produce purchasing by 17.2 uh, percent and 4.9 percent, and the placard 12.4 uh, percent and 7.4 uh, percent. And what's really great about of this result too is we took a look at total purchases and we found that um, total purchases per person per day didn't actually increase and so what was happening is they were swapping uh, the uh, less healthy lower margin foods for the higher margin healthier foods which is great which ties back actually to what we know about consumer spending that when they go to the grocery store they usually come with a fixed budget but leave about half of their budget available for uh, in-store marketing of, of un unplanned wants. So now what we're, what we're working on um, is an effort, again, with the, a retail partner with uh, ad planners. Uh, so ad planners are basically the precursor to sales circulars. Um, and there's a very specific way that these sales circulars are, are created so that they can be um, disseminated in mass to the different uh, geographic reason, regions of a particular chain. So for example, uh, for pay and save, uh, th this particular ad planner refers to their uh, Lubbock area. And so they have specific foods and specific icons that are um, actually embedded within these ad planners. And so we, what we wanted to do after we kind of decoded their process is to go through and look at the menu psychology literature to see how we can make fruit and vegetables a more prominent um, uh, aspect of people's purchasing. So we created a bunch of different sales circulars, about 17 or 18, um, based upon uh, menu, the menu psychology literature and how people read and also uh, pay attention to icons and colors and uh, and so forth and it seemed like almost anything we did was was better than the basic ad that's what that blue line there is in terms of uh, the, the the percentage of, of uh, healthy uh, items considered uh, in, in a particular sales circular but interestingly um, in terms of total healthy items considered so this is this is uh, different than the previous slide in that uh, the previous slide was healthier items as a percentage of total, and this is just simply total healthy items considered. Um, when when we created these sales circulars with WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children program logo, it seemed to have some brand equity that not only did those who uh, uh, who were a part of the WIC program appreciate the increased emphasis of these um, of, of healthier items with the icon, but uh, other people did as well. In fact, uh, when we created this circular with uh, WIC, WIC logo and, and signage on the front of the sales circular, uh, total, the total number of healthy items considered increased by about 40%. Um, the problem with, <clears throat> with some of this research, however, is that you need to actually get permission from individual state WIC offices to do this because, of course, uh, there's a no discrimination clause uh, with with many of these uh, WIC programs within the state, and you need to get special permission to do it. But once you get uh, permission, you can you can actually show show the WIC offices that you you know these these ads are for everyone, not just just for WIC. Then um, WIC offices seem to be okay with it. 
And so these were kind of the, the, the winning sales circuits. If you notice the one on the left, uh, that's the one that uh, was probably the most powerful. And what you see is the boxed off area there with uh, New Mexico WIC signage. And, it, and, and the wording beneath it says uh, something like, you know, with, with WIC, you can purchase all, all kinds of, of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. The following are the most popular. And uh, we actually found that those particular items were the most popular. And not only WIC participants, like, like I mentioned, but others uh, also um, appreciated that, that kind of uh, sales circular signage. And what's interesting also about uh, sales circular signage is that that uh, most people only look at the front page and the back page and very rarely go into the interior. So if you're able to get some of the real estate on front, then it seems to go a long way. And so now we are going to uh, uh, actually later today to, uh, Lub or to Littlefield, Texas to talk about how to continue this research within their stores. I want to thank everyone for uh, taking the, the time out to, to listen to some of this research and, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to this audience and I guess we'll we'll uh, move on from here. Thank you Dr. Payne. We're now going to move into the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Please ask questions using the chat box on your GoToWebinar control panel. So I'd like to start first with a question and this is for both speakers. Uh, we've had a couple of webinar attendees that have written in that not providing SNAP for non-nutritive beverages would be a nudge. And this, what, these webinar attendees are wondering whether either or both of the speakers have thoughts about this. Well, maybe I can start off on that uh, because we've thought a lot about it that at CSPI. You know, it makes, I don't think it makes any sense for the government, government to be subsidizing the purchase of nutritionally worthless foods that are actually harmful. And soft drink consumption has been uh, linked, has been shown to promote weight gain and obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Should that be part of the, WIC, of the SNAP program? Um, rough SNAP re recipients spend about $4 billion a year, $4 billion of SNAP benefits on sugary drinks. Um, so. Uh, what can be done about it? And, and in theory, uh, soda simply could not be allowed. Uh, the Department of Agriculture could issue a rule saying um, stores shall not uh, allow SNAP benefits to be used for soda. And ideally, that would promote healthier diets. But I, I, I doubt very much that that's going to happen. I think a, um, a reasonable course of action would be to get some experiments going, uh, maybe in two or three parts of the country, uh, pilot projects that would uh, ban the use of SNAP benefits for soft drinks, and maybe combine that in some, in some communities with a bonus for fruits and vegetables. Uh, the question is, will those improve overall diets? Or would people simply use their non-SNAP money, you know, the actual cash, to buy the same amount of sugary drinks? The Department of Agriculture is looking for communities that want to sponsor these kinds of programs. Uh, if you know of any, let, uh, let Emily or me know about it. Um, but I think pilot projects is the way to go. And if a pilot project turns out to be successful, a ban on soda it actually improved people's diets. They didn't buy soda with their own. They didn't just replace that soda with what they purchased on their own. Then that would provide a foundation for going national. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. Dr. Payne, do you also would you also like to respond to that question? Well, I like Dr. Jacobson's um, uh, emphasis on on conducting studies because I think sometimes um, we all feel. A particular need to actually go out and, and make these these changes, but we don't understand how they have an effect on consumers and retailers and, and manufacturers um, with a very complex environments. So being able to conduct these pilot tests is a great idea to understand how all these uh, confluences of stakeholders actually are impacted by some of these policies. So 
I no, I, I really I really like that approach. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is for you, Dr. Payne. It, uh, a webinar attendee writes in that um, as you've learned about the floor stickers and that they work, the floor arrows, do you think companies might realize this? I think the attendees referring to food companies um, as well and try to pay retailers to direct people to their products or negotiate with stores to still stay within the path most traveled. You know, I've, we've we've talked a lot about this. So this the whole idea that hey, you know, now we find some of these non-traditional in-store marketing um, interventions work once once uh, uh, manufacturers kind of get a, a an, an idea of some of the stuff. Why wouldn't they just simply pay uh, grocery stores to to have this this space? Well, the answer to that question is is complex. One. They're already paying grocery stores a ton of money for placement of, of their their items. Um, fruit and vegetable, um, uh, the fruit and vegetable area of the grocery store only represents about 10% of the of the entire grocery store on, on average. And if manufacturers are willing to pay even more for uh, in-store marketing, that necessarily means that the profit margins for them are actually decreasing. Um, so I'm not exactly sure that that uh, a bit in, on a long-term perspective that they w w actually would be willing to do this. I think retailers have a, actually have a lot of power to, to help uh, public the public's health. I think a lot of these initiatives need to come from uh, retailers who can kind of claim that share of mind inside the retail space. Of course, they have to play play ball with uh, manufacturers so they actually have inventory to sell. But I think there's a place inside of the grocery store for the retailer to kind of stake claim to um, uh, some of these things so that, uh, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of have some um, corporate responsibility for their their um, the, their consumers. Uh, and to boot, uh, I, I think a lot of the grocery industry is kind of going th this direction anyway. A lot of them are repositioning themselves as, as Healthy grocery stores, and um, and to be able for them to kind of uh, say, okay, uh, the floors and grocery carts are off limits to manufacturers. We are going to actually uh, do our part for the community. It helps them in terms of increasing um, the number of of people who shop at their grocery store. So, I mean, as we've seen with the absolute uh, decrease of of soda consumption over the past. Decade, people are, are people are concerned about their own health and, and may be willing to go to some of these stores that uh, reposition themselves or position themselves better uh, in terms of have, getting consumers help as they shop through the store. Uh, Dr. Payne, this is uh, Michael Jacobson again, and I'm wondering you've published your studies. It looks like it, it's very clear that you found interesting, inexpensive ways to promote the consumption of certain foods like produce. Have any grocers done the picked up on your idea and done it on their own? So what we're what we're working on now, and that's a great question, uh, is the the idea of sustainability. How do you actually have have these in store or these uh, shopper marketing nutrition interventions to be sustainable? And part of the problem is data. That is, a lot of retailers have really good. Um, uh, point of sale systems where you can get some pretty, pretty uh, fine grained data to understand uh, profitability and margins and so forth. The problem with with some of these these things, while uh, they're not profit negative, uh, they may be profit neutral and in, in the best case profit profitable. And so what what we're what we're trying to do is say, well, these things may not be as high on your priority list because you you have other other um, um, ideas that may actually be more profitable in terms of expanding consumer budgets, which we're not about, they sh they probably should be inside of your toolbox so that you you can kind of uh, kind of position or pivot towards kind of how the grocery industry is is uh, working anyway. And so so to answer your question point blankly, yes, I mean the retailer that we're working with now, uh, we're going to put it in. Some of these interventions long term in in one third of their chain, um, and so once once we're kind of at the point now that once we're able to do that and collect the data from those stores in mass, and these guys are great. I mean, they're going to introduce us to their uh, their retail uh, colleagues um, 
from around around the country to see if we can, you know, kind of spread this these ideas around. Thank you both for your thoughts on this important aspect. Uh, I'd also like to add, Dr. Payne, I agree with you that retailers can and really should be playing a role to benefit the public's health. Another area that you touched upon while you spoke is uh, the checkout aisle. Since checkout prompts so many impulse purchases, the placement of healthy products in that location would be another way that retailers could support the public's health and their shoppers' health. Uh, the next question that we have is a question for Dr. Jacobson. The question is, why did it take the FDA so long to ban partially hydrogenated oil? Well, there's tremendous resistance from the food industry. It does not want to make changes. And, you know, and partially hydrogenated oil uh, was a little bit cheaper than other oils, so that, that's a, an important consideration. Um, and the Food and Drug Administration itself moves so slowly. And, um, initially, though, I think that, you know, so we first petitioned in 1994 for labeling. I think it was reasonable for the FDA to wait a couple of years while the evidence built up, but 10 years is way too long, especially after Denmark banned it, you know, which um, Denmark is a sophisticated little country that doesn't do things lightly. So, uh, you know, a couple of years fine. Uh, 10 years is too long, and it reflects the power of the food industry. Thank you very much. The next question that we have is a question for Dr. Payne, and uh, I think an important one for folks uh, across the country that are looking to work with retailers on a number of different public health initiatives. And the question is, how did you build the relationship with the grocery chains to get access to some of their information and sales data? A couple, a couple different ways. So, I mean, <laughs> to be honest, uh, the, probably the biggest factor was luck. I mean, we cold called this uh, this company and, uh, and 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 said we would drive out to them and, and do whatever they wanted uh, uh, to. Uh, so they would they would at least give an hour of their time to listen to what we were trying to do. And they point blank told us that you know they've they've been in contact with others who have have, have tried to do uh, these public health interventions inside of grocery stores, but what ends up happening is, is underlying kind of these, these activities is a uh, decrease in profitability for the store. And so, you know, they were skeptical at first, but we, you know, we told them that, you know, we did our, we did our research and we found that we knew that, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables are higher margin, but we also didn't want to expand the the uh, the budgets of already cash strapped consumers, and we thought we had a win-win way to do that. And they said, "Okay, we'll give you a shot. Let's let's see how this works." And so uh, we 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 conducted some small pilot studies at first, and we came back and showed them the data, and they they really liked it. In fact, uh, it was a real good public relations um, um, activity for them. But at that same time, the New York Times got a hold of it. And uh, and that just I mean basically opened up all the doors. After that, they they allowed us uh, access to their their data, and uh, I mean and it it just ends up being building relationships of, of trust. I mean they trust us completely, and and um, we trust them. I mean it's a, it's a great partnership. Uh, never in it to to see how we can harm the company or expose their company in any any way, and and told them that we want to make them a, a star in their community for, for public health and at the same time, uh, you know, not decrease their profitability because they're, they're, you know, they, have, they employ a lot of people across the, the Southwest and, and it's a lot of people's livelihood that are at, at stake. I mean, they should do r the right thing for the right thing, but you also have to think about, you know, kind of how, how business works and, and how you can kind of make sure that their interests are being met as well as public health. So. Well, thank you. Um, you know, these relationships, as you just spoke about, are so important. And you spoke a little bit about the press. It really seems like the press loves to cover these uh, healthy retail initiatives that retailers are taking on. So I think it's a really wonderful opportunity for retailers to get positive press in the news. Um, and so the next question that we have is for Dr. Jacobson. And this, this webinar attendee asks, 
are there more nudges that are necessary in regards to trans fats, or are we at the end? I think the trans fat battle is essentially done. Uh, there are some foods in the supermarket that still have trans fat, refrigerated biscuits uh, is one category, some baked goods. So it's worth looking at the label, still looking at the label for trans fat, but you know, it's, uh, it's really almost out. So I think you can stop worrying or working on that and get on to other things. You know, uh, and salt and added sugars, particularly uh, added sugars in beverages, that those are two biggies. And you know, the other side of the coin, how do you get people to eat more fruits and vegetables that Dr. Payne has been talking about? You know, that's that's very important. We we should be filling up on fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, low-fat uh, animal products, and um, and you know, I think it's a maybe a bigger challenge to get people to eat things that are good for them uh, than getting people to stop eating things that are bad for them. Thank you. Uh, trans fats is such a huge public health victory, and this is a piggyback question to that. And the question is, why was the trans fat campaign so effective, and how can we um, use some of the lessons learned from that success in some of these other campaigns? The big thing was having the scientific evidence. You know, for a long time, there was no evidence, there was very little evidence that trans fat posed any risks at all. But then the evidence started coming in, uh, and not enough initially to warrant government action, but uh, it gradually over 10 years that built up to such a level that that justified prohibiting the use of, of partially hydrogenated oil. With salt, the evidence is, is clearly there that uh, too much salt increases blood pressure, which increases the risks of heart attacks and strokes. So I think there's, um, and that's, and the FDA itself thinks there's sufficient evidence not to ban salt, of course, but to press the food industry to lower the amounts of, of salt and other sources of sodium. With sugar, the evidence is, is clearly there, especially for sugary drinks. Uh, they've been linked in, in clinical studies, in intervention studies, epidemiology, to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, uh, sugary foods other than beverages, cookies, frozen desserts, uh, candies, they, they contribute to, I think there's general agreement that they contribute to tooth decay. There's some evidence that they contribute to heart disease. Uh, they almost certainly reduce overall uh, nutrient intake. You know, you fill up on junk foods, you don't eat more nutritious foods. But that's, the, um, that's one area where we need more research. And the more solid research there is, that would inform public policy decisions. Thank you. Dr. Jacobson. The next question is for Dr. Payne, and we've uh, perhaps touched upon this a little bit, but we've had several questions um, about how interventions like the ones that you spoke about can become permanent. Um, a webinar attendee asks, when there, is a, when there is success in getting an intervention into a store or several stores, how do we convince these retailers to maintain the changes? What are, you know, what are some strategies? I think one very large opportunity exists with the SnapEd community. And uh, I know a little bit about the SnapEd community, but uh, what I have seen recently is that uh, uh, SnapEd is opening their arms more to community interventions like this to partner with, with retailers to do some of this type of, of uh, uh, community uh, partnerships. I think with SnapEd, um, there can be a widespread change in communities that not only looks at uh, education, um, but also uh, these some of these interventions in inside of stores. And and I think I, I think it's a program that can have have a very large impact on public health with regards to. The, the question asked, I mean, if SnapEd can actually start engaging with their individual communities uh, in their individual states and cities, I think these things can be sustainable forever. So. 
Thanks very much for those thoughts. Um, I'd like to ask either of the speakers, both of the speakers, if there are questions that you wish had been asked or additional things that uh, you wanted to discuss uh, before concluding today's webinar. Yeah, I think uh, we had a, a really good discussion, some good questions, and I hope we were at least a little bit inspiring to people out there. Yeah, and I, I want to thank Dr. Jacobson for his, his insights, too. I learned a lot from uh, his presentation, his comments, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to this audience and uh, looking forward to, um, uh, to continuing on this type of activity, and hopefully we can all make a, a, a big impact in public health. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Jacobson and Dr. Payne, for your two excellent presentations and for this discussion that we've had. We're near the end of the hour. Uh, I'd also like to thank Stephanie and the Food Trust for co-hosting today's webinar and all of the webinar attendees for joining today's webinar about this very important topic. We'll be sending out a recording of today's webinar to all registrants, and please stay tuned for an announcement about the next webinar in the 2016 Healthy Retail Webinar Series. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.